Where's Larissa? That was fantastic worship, Larissa. Thank you for that. It's really cool. Very cool. You know, can I can I be a bit open and a bit vulnerable? Is that all right? I might cry. <laughs> My kids love it when I cry. <laughs> you know, we were sitting around our kitchen table last night having dinner, um, Julie and me and the two boys. And Benito, he has a habit of just asking questions out of the blue. And um, he asked this question, he said, how do you relate to God? And it's really interesting because just the day before, on the Friday, um, I'd caught up with my mentor as part of the Baptist Church's thing. Each pastor has a mentor. And we were talking, and I was talking about a few different things. And the one thing he raised with me, which is something I know I'm pretty aware of, is the fact that I grew up without a dad, grew up without a father, and so... Um, he said, I really feel like you need to work on seeing God as your father. It's really a, a, an area of growth for you. He's like, oh, thanks for that. Not that I didn't know that, but thanks for that. But Benito asked me, or asked us, you know, how do you relate to God? And I said, I struggle relating to God as father. I'm, I find it easy to relate to him as my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. Like, that's cool, I can relate to that. But actual father is really a hard thing to do. And you know, this morning in worship, as we we're worshipping, Julie got up and shared that vision she had. About five minutes before that, as I was worshipping, I saw the same thing. It was just, yeah, it was just really incredible. I just saw myself as a child and God as my father. And it was... It's just amazing. <coughs> Everyone's crying. <laughs> but just that image. It's, God's just amazing. And this is the critical thing about us gathering together as a church. Is that when we do as a corporate body and we worship God, God is in our midst. That's what he says. He dwells in our praises. He dwells in our worship. And he speaks to us and he reveals stuff to us and, and he opens our eyes. And as your pastor, guess what? I've got a long way to go myself and I've got to grow myself. And that's, I want to encourage you with that because you just don't know what God wants to do. That God would open our eyes to who he is really in our lives and he wants us to know him fully. Isn't that cool? It's really good. Might as well pack up and go home now. <laughs> but I want to pray for Candice. She's about to have a baby. I just felt to pray for you, Candice. And uh, uh, Michael's not here today, but we'll pray for both of you. But we don't have to come up the front. But would you mind just standing where you are and a few of the ladies or whoever feels to gather around her? You know, it's, a, it's just a, an incredible miracle that you are having another child and and it's just god's blessing and god's hand on your life and i'm going to ask Jude to come and pray for candace as as a mother and uh yeah thanks let's pray for candace can i ask god father i just thank you for candace god i thank you for Candace and for Michael, God. And I thank you, Father, that you've given them the blessing of a new baby. God, we just pray, God, that over this next week as she prepares herself even further to deliver this child, God, we pray your presence, your peace, your comfort and your strength be her portion, Father. We pray, God, that this, as this baby is birthed, God, that they're the miraculous wonder of a new life, God. We thank you for that today in advance, God. We pray, God, you would be with them in every moment, in every circumstance, God. And God, I pray for your peace that surpasses their understanding would be their portion. God, we thank you for this family. We thank you, God, for Toby, God. We thank you, 
oh, so much for them and who they are. And God, we just pray, pray for your blessing and your provision and your peace to be theirs in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Keep praying for Candice this week that she actually pops it out and that <laughs> and everything's good. Is that right? Yeah. Smooth. Easy. Done. The awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's come around the word. Is that good? Let's pray and uh, we'll come around the word. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst, in this congregation, in this church, in this body. And pray that even today you would deepen our understanding of what it means to be your children and to be your body and to serve you with everything we have. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I started a series called Faith Practices. And our scripture or our key text is 1 Peter 3 verses 8 to 11. Why don't we do something different today? Why don't you all stand to your feet for the reading of the word? How's that sound? Let's honor the word by standing. We, we stand when the national anthem happens. So let's stand when we hear the word of God. Not for the whole time, but just for, as I read it. But we can even read it together. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil, your lips from telling lies, turn away from evil and do good, search for peace and work to maintain it. Bless the reading of the word. Have your seats. Something fresh, something new, something different. As I talked a few weeks ago, as followers of Jesus... This passage tells us that God has called us to live out our faith practically. This passage lists a number of faith practices. Now, these things are things that we show, that we do to show who we belong to. These things aren't defined by words alone, but they are defined by the way we live our life. A few weeks ago, I talked about the analogy of this in being a clean person who wants to be a clean person who considers themselves to be clean in this place you can put your hand up you consider no you don't none of you are clean Did, who showered this morning did you not thank you thank goodness for that gee who brushed their teeth today see these are all daily practices of personal hygiene that keep us clean. Isn't that right? But if you don't do these daily practices, can you declare yourself to be clean? Have you ever left the house and you've forgotten to brush your teeth? And you get in the car and you drive and you go, oh, my mouth feels gross. It's like, oh, I'm not clean. I need to go and buy some chewing gum or something. To just to Anyone had that experience? Well, you know, we can talk about being a Christian to the cows come home. But the reality is until we actually put into practice the idea of living our lives as Jesus lived or following role modeling our lives after Jesus and it actually being outworked in our life, it's only a belief if all we do is talk about it. But when we put it into practice, it actually becomes a faith that we live by. Does that make sense? A few weeks, or last week, actually Anzac Day, where most of you were at the footy. Um, I just had to throw that in. It's, uh, uh, sorry. We're not talking about football today, are we? We, all of us, you know, except for David Burford, he's happy. 
Um, so Mao talked about this idea of searching for peace and working to maintain it. If you didn't see it, you can get it on YouTube or the podcast. It's a great message to listen to. But today, I'm going to start from the very beginning, from the very first practice that God calls us to. And it says in that first verse, in verse 8, Finally, all... What does that mean? Everyone? It doesn't say, finally, the pastor, or finally, the volunteers, those who volunteer, or finally... I don't know, can't think of another thing. But it says, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Now, this idea of one-mindedness, uh, this that of us being of one mind, can also be translated in other versions as like-mindedness. Be, a, be of a one accord is another way it's described. Or be harmonious, like an orchestra, all be in tune with each other. Um, that type of idea. But most commonly, it's also described as unity. And so today I want to talk about this faith practice of practicing unity with each other. Now this kind of harmony and unity this passage is talking about, this one mind, this one accord, was synonymous with the early church. Uh, in Acts, the early church is described that all the believers were united in heart and mind. We know the story of the early church when the day of Pentecost happened and, and God, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and, and uh, Peter preached and 3,000 were added in a day. And this amazing uh, unity happened amongst the people that were, they lacked nothing amongst them. And, and over, if you read the epistles and the letters to the early church, continually the apostles would encourage them would implore them, would, would stir them up and, and say, make sure you maintain unity with each other. It was, a, it's a, it was a, a mantra. It was something that was said over and over again. If you read the, the epistles of Paul or the letters of Paul that Paul wrote to the church, he would continually, whether it was Romans or Ephesians or Galatians, Colossians or Philippians, he would be saying, make sure you maintain unity. Make sure you, you stand together, be of one accord, one heart, one mind. Peter says it here in, in his letter to the church. James has a similar uh, encouragement in his letter, and even John talks about unity. It's a, it's a key faith practice that we are called to as the church. And this idea of unity within the church, and especially within the early church, was it wasn't just an idea. It was a way of life. It was a, not a philosophy. It was the, a, a faith practice that they were committed to with all their heart. I read uh, a quote from one theologian, William Barclay, and he says this, which is really interesting to read. He says, In the New Testament, there rings this plea for Christian unity. But it is more than a plea. It is an announcement that the Christian cannot live the Christian life unless in his personal relationships he is at unity with his fellow man. And that the church cannot be the Christian church if there are divisions within it. It poses a pretty serious question. If you are having disunity and disharmony in your life, how is that reflecting on your walk with Jesus? There's a challenge. Well, we won't ponder on that too long. But in our letter that Peter's writing to the church, it makes sense. Peter was there when the church was established. He was right there amongst it. So it makes sense that when he's talking about being of one mind and one accord and in unity with one another, he is reflecting back on what they had experienced in the early church, these amazing days of so much unity where no one lacked. They were all committed to one another and, and uh, is incredible. But when sometimes when you look back, you can be romantic, can't you? And you think, oh, I was so good in the good old days and have rose-colored glasses. But I don't feel like Peter's doing that. But he's stirring on the church. He's reminding them, 
hey, come on, church. Finally, this is the most critical thing. Be of one accord. Be of one mind. And because he also knew and, and would remember the challenges that they would have had and that they did have as the early church, the challenges from outside and from even within it that would challenge them. But they had discovered that above all things, they needed to maintain unity. Now, <laughs> let me explain this a bit deeper because sometimes we think the Holy Spirit fell and they, they all were moved by God's Spirit and they just had unity because God made it happen. If you read Acts, you understand that it didn't just happen. It was something they had to work at. Just because they were full of the Holy Spirit, it didn't mean unity happened automatically. If you In Acts 2, the day of Pentecost happened. A couple of chapters later in Acts 6, guess what happened? The first challenge to their unity happened. And it didn't come from outside, from persecution and so forth. It actually came from within the church. You see, there were two groups of Jews. One were the Hellenic Jews and the other were the local Jewish-speaking Jews. And, and these two groups, or the Hellenic Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, were complaining to the apostles saying, why on earth uh, it seems like you're favouring your local Jews? the ones that speak Jewish, you're, you're, you're favouring them above us. It's not fair. Anyone heard that sort of thing in church? It's not fair. And so this complaint happened and it could have easily split the church. It could have easily brought all sorts of damage to the church. But thankfully the apostles sought God and asked God for a solution and they came up with a solution. But the reality is that this idea of things threatening the unity of the church continually happened. A few chapters later in Acts chapter 11, just after Peter has seen this amazing move of God amongst the Gentiles, amongst Cornelius and his household, he comes back to Jerusalem and guess what? They challenge him on it. There are people complaining and say, why are you bringing the good news to Gentiles? Don't you know they're unclean? Don't you know that, that, that Jesus doesn't, we don't mix with them? They're not of us? And so all of a sudden, this what God is wanting to do was being challenged by complaining. But God helped them. And they, what they aimed to do is strive for unity because they understood that unity was critical. And this didn't just happen in major things like, like these two examples I've given you, but it also happened personally. There were very, some very personal public disagreements. Paul with Barnabas had a public disagreement. Paul with Peter had a public disagreement. So there was all these challenges from, from within the church where people were different and people thought differently and people had different ideas of what should happen. And, and then there was also coming in against that was the persecution from outside. And so you can understand that unity could easily be threatened. But the thing that the early church had learnt from its foundation was that when they were in one accord, that's when they were most powerful. That's when they saw God do amazing things. So throughout church history, early church history, there was this cry and this uh, encouragement and this desire to have unity, to have oneness, to have one mind and one accord. And throughout the early church throughout the epistles you read about it over and over again and then i don't know when this started but the first person who actually wrote it down was augustine and he wrote this mantra that became a mantra of the church and this mantra simply said in essentials unity what's he mean by that in essentials he means by the things that matter most we must maintain unity the, the things that we must maintain unity is that jesus is god and that he came to earth and died for our sins and rose again to give us freedom in Jesus, in, in Jesus Christ. That this is, and the way to salvation is not by works, but by grace through faith. These are the essentials that we stand together on. That Jesus is the Son of the living God. That he is the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that came and that loves us and that cares for us. This is the unity. These are the things we stand on. The things that they stood on in the early church was fellowship. 
that we must not forsake the gathering together of the saints because our fellowship is critical to maintain our unity. That we, we stand on the teaching of the apostles. That this is the essential that we, these days, they called it the teaching of the apostles then, but these days we call it the word of God. And the word of God is our authority for why we do and live. And prayer and, and another essential for them was communion that they would share communion every time they would gather together. See, these are the essentials. And in our essentials, we, ma- we strive and maintain unity in these things. In the non-essentials, we declare liberty. So Paul talked about these things that non-essentials were things like what you eat and drink. Do, do, you, do you eat food given to idols or not? And And the idea of this is that that's up to your conviction with God. In your walk with those sorts of things, you know, infant baptism or, or fa- believer's baptisms, all these things, they're, they're not essentials, but they're up to your conviction, if that makes sense. But critically and most significantly in all things, love. That love covers all things. That in everything we do, we do with love. Because as Paul said in Romans, love is the most important thing of all. So for us to understand unity, it's really important for us to first understand what unity isn't. Okay? And the thing that we need to understand is that unity does not mean uniformity. Anyone heard that? Unity does not mean uniformity, but it does mean cooperation in the midst of diversity. We can often fall into the trap, especially in our modern world, of only spending time with people who agree or think like us and and look like us and and consider things like we consider them. That's a very easy thing to do. Uh, You know, I'll, I'll digress for a moment, but it's one of my pet hates is this is social media not uh, it's a necessary evil i call it um to stay in contact with people these days but what happens with social media and if you if you want to check it out there's a really good documentary called the social dilemma it's on youtube and netflix it's worth a watch anyone heard of logarithms yeah algorithms <laughs> all of those rhythms isn't a logarithm an algorithm? No? Oh. oh, okay. It's terrible when you've got smart kids. Um, but these algorithms, what they do is they, they look at what you look at. Has anyone ever been talking at the dining table about, oh, I want to go to this thing or I want to buy this, and then all of a sudden you open your social media and there's also an ad for what you're looking for? Anyone had that experience? Because if you have your microphone open, they can actually hear what you're talking about. It's crazy. But what they'll, they'll, look, they'll see what you're looking at, see what you're looking into, and then they will flood your social media with things about that. So what that means is some of us can live in a bubble where we're only hearing the voices that we want to hear or that we agree with and think about, and we don't actually think beyond our own social bubble. It's a reality. Watch Social Dilemma. It's, it's very challenging. Because this, the problem is what happens when we only hear from people that are like us is that we're ne- never challenged to change. We're never challenged to think further or deeper about things. We just rest in what we know. And this happens in the church a lot. Now, we are blessed in our church to have such an intergenerational churches. But sometimes, you know, young people are drawn to churches with lots of other young people. Or old people are drawn to churches with lots of other old people. And they, if you only ever spend time with your generation, how will you ever understand anything that other generations have to give up? Does that make sense? Let me, let me, I'm going to stick on this for a while because one of my pet hates, another one, is the way politics has become such a big thing in church life or many churches' lives. And, it, and church is not about politics, but what tends to happen in that case is that 
people start to go start to thinking that to be a Christian you need to follow a certain political party. Let me say this, God is neither left wing or right wing. God is bigger than our politics and our governance. He is greater than that and we can't ever think that if I'm going to be a Christian then I can only vote for a certain party. No way, we are above that. It's not about that. And But this is the problem when we live in a bubble that we only hear what we want to hear. And we're never challenged to think differently. But when God talks about unity and the type of unity is calling in the church, we understand what this unity is like by the way God describes his church. How does God describe the church? God des- describes it as his body. If you think of the body, you understand that the body is made up of many different parts that work together in unity with one another. And when they do, when all your body parts, so an arm isn't a leg, or a heart isn't a brain, or a stomach isn't a foot, they all have their roles and parts to play, but they're all very different. But when they all work together in unity and, and serve and work to, with each other, you have a healthy body. When you have an unhealthy body is when some parts overwork or underwork. And then all of a sudden there's a problem. If your heart's not functioning problem, then it makes the whole body unhealthy. And the whole body has to try to compensate for it. Isn't that right? And this is the picture that God gives us of the type of unity he has called us to. My, oh, there it is. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, the human body has many parts, but many parts make up one whole, whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Right here you see why unity is so important to strive for, for us as the body of Christ. The aim is not so we can all be the same. The aim of the body is not that every part is the same. Isn't that right? But the aim of unity in the church is to show the world practically and authentically what is possible when we have God in our lives. Think about that for the moment. Our unity is drawn together to show the world that when we are united and working together, what it does is it shows the world what is possible when you have God in your life. This is what happened in the early church. This is what amazed the world with the early church because the the early church, the world the early church lived in was as secular and as separated as our church. Jews didn't mix with Gentiles. Slaves didn't mix with rich. Uh, males didn't mix with females, unless they were part of the family. So the amazing thing about the early church is all of a sudden, Jews were mixing with Gentiles. All of a sudden, women and men had equality with each other. Uh, in all of a sudden, slave and rich mixed together in the early church. Free and, and, and slave. It, it was incredible. And so the world looked from outside and thought, what on earth is going on here? These people are all different, but they are one with one another. They are working together. They are serving one another. They, like the, a healthy body, they are incredible. And what people were saying is, how can I get in on this? I want to be a part of this because this is amazing. And this is the thing, is that when we stand united and our aim is to be united, we are an amazing testimony for God's goodness. Because the thing we have in common is, is Jesus Christ, first and foremost, and who he is. I, I want to read you a quote from Reverend Jack Arnold, which is really encouraging but also very challenging. There is no ch- challenge to love if everyone in a congregation thinks exactly alike. The challenge comes when we accept, respect, and show concern for those Christians who do not agree with us. How, how hard is it to have unity if we all thought and acted exactly the same way? That's not unity, that's uniformity. But when we have unity is when 
we all come from different backgrounds, different thought patterns, different ideas, but we stand together under the banner of Christ and say we're going to serve one another and love one another in spite of our differences. That's what real unity is. Now, when it comes to unity, Peter tells us and commands us to to stand together as one. But uh, he also then shows us really clearly what genuine Christianity or Christian unity looks like. And as you read on in the passage, all these different things are the attributes that will bring us unity together. So I want to just quickly share the number of different attributes of unity that Peter is calling us to. The first one is to be sympathetic. Now this literally means to suffer with one another. Who likes that idea? Suffering with one another. If uh, In Romans 12 it says it like this, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And uh, Paul says it this way in Corinthians 12, 24 to 26, But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. So sympathy or having sympathy for one another brings unity together because we understand that if, if Tristan's having a hard time and struggling, then that will affect me. Uh, we suffer together. One part suffers, we all suffer. When one, one part's rejoicing, let's all rejoice. But this is the incredible way that we can maintain unity by being sympathetic. The next one is brotherly love, which uh, rea- in reality, love is the truest sign of Christianity. But uh, Jesus said it this way in John thirteen thirty four and 35, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We love quoting that, don't we? But the fact is, this is what we are called to do, and this is how we maintain unity, is if we love one another as Jesus loved us. Now, there's a really cool illustration of this, of the type of love that we're called to and what it has, or what sort of effect it has on us, is a wheel. Now imagine the hub of the wheel, the centerpiece of the wheel, is Jesus. And the spokes are you and me. Now there's there's a few ideas here that we can ponder on, but the closer we are to Jesus, the closer we are to each other. Isn't that right? Does that make sense? So the closer we are to Jesus' love and understanding how much Jesus loves us and that he loves us without condition and unconditionally, and when we are close to that kind of love, it brings us closer together. Isn't that right? But you can also talk that in the opposite way as well, is the closer we are together and having relationship together and the the closer we get together, guess what? The closer we get together. To Jesus. That in our relationships with one another, the closer we get to each other, the closer we support one another, the closer we love one another, begins to bring us closer to Jesus. Powerful thought. The next faith practice that it talks about is to be compassionate. Now, the way this is translated is to be tender-hearted. My clicker's not working very well today. Paul says it like this in Ephesians. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, or tender-hearted to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgave you. You. There's a challenge. That part of being compassionate involves forgiveness. Now, compassion also involves giving of yourself for the benefit of another, 
to meet their needs rather than to meet your own needs. I'll share with you a quote from Mother Teresa where she said, The biggest disease today is not leprosy or cancer. It's the feeling of being uncared for or unwanted, of being deserted and alone. The greatest evil is the lack of love and charity. It's an indifference towards one's neighbor who may be the victim of poverty or disease or exploited and at the end of, the, of his life left at a roadside. Obviously referring to the story of the Good Samaritan. But this is the, the challenge in our day and age that we would show compassion to those in need. The next thing that we attribute of unity is to be humble. It's a very common for us as Christians to understand humility is an important aspect of maintaining unity. As Christians, we should honor humility. We, it's part of us admitting that we are sinners and we need God. And the greatest example of humility that we have is Jesus himself. As, he, as it says in Philippians 2, 7 and 8, instead, talking about Jesus, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a hu human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. If it was good enough for Jesus to humble himself, then it's good enough for us to humble ourselves. And when we humble ourselves, what we're saying is, there go I, but for the grace of God. When someone is, you're worried about someone or you see someone not doing the right thing, you, you come alongside them and support them because you know that together we're stronger. And, so, and you know that without support, you would be in the same boat as them. Does that make sense? That's how we maintain unity through humility. And the last thing Peter encourages us to do is to not repay evil for evil, which is a challenge. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Romans 12:21. 12, 12, Got to get new batteries, I think. Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Pretty straightforward. If we're going to maintain unity with each other, we don't have a take an eye for an eye, do we? We actually repay evil for good. This is really interesting because. When we often consider evil and we see people doing the wrong thing or doing something that's evil, we think the person is evil. We must remember evil is in our world because of sin and Satan. That's why we have evil in our world. That, that they're being motivated by the, the liar and by the, the father of evil, Satan himself. So they're not the evil one. He is the evil one. People aren't evil inherently. God created them to be good. He created them in his image. It's sin and the enemy that corrupts. So we must never look at people as evil. We must see them as God sees them, with love and compassion and unity. That's, let's separate the reality here. That it's... It's the actions that are evil and the, what they're doing is evil, but they, does, God loves them as they are. And so we should do the same. This is the critical thing because the author of evil is, is not mankind, it's Satan himself. Does that make sense? All right. Let's bring it to a close. You're all looking hungry. Philippians 2.5 sums up for us the aim of our unity uh, and the aim for our the one-mindedness that God has called us to. It says there, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset. Think the same way as Jesus. What did Jesus do? He humbled himself. What did Jesus do? He pursued unity. He pursued unity, number one, with the Father. Isn't that right? 
that his main aim was to know the Father and to do whatever the Father asked him to do. Our mindset should be the same, that we should pursue Jesus with everything we have, to pursue unity, to, to have the same mindset of, as Jesus in our relationships with one another. Jesus' re- mindset was that I'll do whatever the Father asked me to do. Jesus' mindset was that I came to save and to serve those which were lost. I came to love those who no one else cared for. I came to reach out to the broken and the hurting, to, to those who are trapped in sin. This, this was his mindset. And that our mindset should be the same in our relationships. In John 17, I'm going to finish with this. Jesus prayed his final prayer and he makes it very clear in his prayer of his desire to see us as the church in the same kind of unity or practicing the same kind of unity as he had with the Father. It's a powerful prayer. And he literally says and explains that in our relationships with each other, we, are, we can be a witness for God himself. I want us to read it together and just consider this. This is Jesus praying. This is just before he goes to the crucifixion. And this is what his prayer is for us, for you and me, not just for the disciples at the time. Because he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe who will ever believe in me through this message. Who's that? That's us. We're the ones that have believed because of the message that has been passed down through the apostles. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. And then he says this, I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. May they experience such perfect unity. This is what Jesus is praying for us. That we would experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus prayed that we would have this kind of unity. The same kind of unity as he has with the Father. That kind of oneness. What a challenge is this for us as a church. That we would strive for unity because Jesus compels us to. But at the same time, that our unity with one another would be a light to the world that we live in of what is possible when you are in a relationship with God. This is what Jesus is talking about. That when we are in a relationship with him, that he would change us and transform us so much that we would mix with people we would never mix with before. But not just mix with them. That we would do life with them. That we would live life and that we would be there for one another. That we would be compassionate and sympathetic and and loving and, and like that will, we would be drawing closer together so we can be closer to Jesus. Our unity with each other and with one another is what shows the world around us that with God there are no divisions, there are no barriers, there are no boundaries, that he crosses all the boundaries. This is, this is why our unity is so important. It's not so that we be the same, it's so that we support and love and stand with one another and the knowledge that God loves me and he loves everyone else as well. I guess my challenge to us at the end of this message, because it's not easy to maintain unity. It's easy to talk behind people's backs and, and be angry at people and when they don't do what you want them to do. But to strive for unity is hard work. But God's promise and God's prayer is that we would have unity. Because in our unity, 
the world will know who God is, that he is a God that breaks down barriers. He is a God that overcomes obstacles. He is a God that does the impossible. He causes people from all different backgrounds to be united with one another. Church, let's pursue this kind of unity. As hard as it may be, this should be our heart. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in everything, love. Let's pray. I know there's a lot to unpack from what I've shared this morning. But there may be just one thing that you can hold on to. Maybe it's about compassion or sympathy or loving each other, humility, not repaying evil for evil, but forgiving each other. Who knows what God's putting his hand on in your life. But can I pray and can you pray that whatever it is that he would give you the strength to maintain unity, to strive for unity, to seek unity at every place and corner and opportunity. That above all things, let's aim for unity. Lord God, that's our prayer today. That as you declare, we are your body and a healthy body is a united body where every part does its bit. And every part supports every other part. And when they're all working together in oneness, that body is healthy and functional and doing its bit. Lord, we pray for those parts right now that are suffering and and doing it tough. And we pray that the healthy parts might come alongside and, and strengthen and enable and love and care for that part. Lord, we pray for those parts that are doing great at the moment and and rejoicing and enjoying great blessing and we pray that we would rejoice with them and stand with them and and enjoy all that God is doing but above all Lord God we pray for unity we pray for one mind one heart that with this church would become a place where people look in and go I can't believe those sorts of people are spending time together what is it that makes that possible And that we could introduce them to God's incredible love and his son Jesus who paid the ultimate price for us. Lord, that's our prayer. That we would honour your sacrifice with our unity with one another. Help us do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.